It looks like we have attacks on free speech. Free speech. Uh, no doubt. If you say something that uh, upsets somebody, you know it might upset somebody, they can they can sue you. And if it's controversial enough, they can sue you into bankruptcy and oblivion. Robert, uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have you back. I've been following along with all the stuff you've been talking about. I am I'm shocked, I'm alarmed of what's going on. There's attacks happening all over the place. And so I've been wanting to talk to you for a couple of weeks, so I'm glad we finally got a chance to do this. Absolutely. So, um, man, there's so many things that so many things to dive into, so many topics to jump into. Um, let's start with the one, um, a big one, <laughs> and then we'll, we can dive down. So um, I've been talking about, I've been seeing, it looks like we have attacks on free speech from like almost every angle. I've been saying that I believe we're in a war. Um, it's just a war of information and money. And so um, on the information front, um, if the powers that be are losing their grip on the narrative, then they have to up their game to win the war on information. And so they need to find ways to censor people, silence people, et cetera. So I've been seeing this as this attack on free speech from multiple angles. So a couple of ones that I've seen are the Alex Jones trial, right? Um, they're trying to use something that has this unanimous consensus that everybody thinks is bad and use that to chip away. We have the Trump January 6 um, thing going on. And then we had this tornado cash, which was like a public utility or protocol. But I think they all look like a tax on free speech to me. What's your take on that? Uh, no doubt. And in fact, the case that a lot of people have not paid enough attention to is the Alex Jones trials. So in those cases, they're using it as a test case to whether you can basically run show trials in America, complete show trials. So they have gutted him of all of his procedural rights, not allowed to bring motions to dismiss, not allowed to bring motions for summary judgment, not allowed to challenge the legal sufficiency of the case against him, not allowed even to testify on his own behalf as to his innocence. He, the only, in fact, it's a trial that's guilty until proven guiltier, <laughs> where he is not allowed to defend himself where evidence against him is introduced, but he is not allowed to impeach or cross-examine that evidence in a meaningful way. Now, in fact, for example, in the Connecticut trial going on right now, the, uh, the judges said there's one name that cannot even be talked about in the entire trial, and that's Hillary Clinton. That's how insane the case is, even though Hillary Clinton has a lot to do with how that trial came about. So, uh, and, and the reason for that is their secondary objective. Uh, they're stripping him of all of his procedural rights, his day in court. He isn't given any day in court. His uh, right to trial by jury on the merits. He's being denied his right to trial by jury on the merits. Uh, they claim that he didn't participate in discovery, but anybody watching the trial realizes he must have because they have more discovery the other side than anybody's ever had to give in any case. It's, it's about ultimately uh, using him as an example to take away other people's speech. Because the legal precedent they're establishing, because the other unique factor here is Jones is being sued for like unfair competition and trade laws and consumer protection laws. But the people suing him are not consumers. They're people who disagree with what he said about topics over the years. Um, and in, uh, instead, it's basically a defamation case, yet they're being allowed to sue under these theories that no one's ever heard of being applied in this context before. But the it's not only that the constitutional requirement is that you can't be sued for defamation unless you say a specifically factual statement that's false that you know to be false about someone specific. So that's how we protect robust free speech. We uh, and there's no such thing as a wrong idea in America. Yet they're trying to gut all of that because in the Jones case he never talked about uh, the people that are suing him. Never mentioned him by name, never referenced him, so forth. Uh, the people that are suing him, uh, there's only one or two people that even got referenced directly or indirectly. Almost all the people who are suing him include an FBI agent. You have an FBI agent suing him who didn't identify anything Alex Jones ever even said about him. And he's an FBI lawyer. So how is this FBI lawyer being allowed to sue? Yeah. The, the new theory is if you say something that uh, upsets somebody and you know it might upset somebody, they can sue you. And if it's controversial enough, they can sue you into bankruptcy and oblivion, as the plaintiff's lawyers have said is their exact plan here. In the Connecticut case, they said it out loud in the courtroom. 
The plaintiff's lawyer said justice is preventing Alex Jones from ever having a microphone, ever having uh, access to the media, ever being able to have his opinion heard by you, the people, ever again. And that's why the Jones case is so dangerous. They're trying to establish the precedent that they can use lawfare in the legal system to completely financially obliterate any dissident opinion. And it's a precarious precedent. And because it's Alex Jones and because the topic is Sandy Hook, most people are too scared to look into it, to talk about it, to challenge the media narrative, to contest what's happening, to expose what's happening. Too many people on the right who have disagreements with Alex Jones are letting those disagreements with Alex Jones blind the fact that just like he was the canary in the coal mine on big tech, mm -hmm. when they took out Alex Jones, they used it as the precedent to ultimately take out the president of the United States. Right. They're now using him in the lawfare arena to say, we, if we don't like your speech, we can now use the state court civil justice system to bankrupt you because we don't like your speech. And we can do it without ever giving you your day in court, without ever giving you trial by jury on the merits, without ever giving you basic core rights that every American is supposed to have. Wow. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. So um, little known fact, uh, people will find out here, but about two weeks ago, I went and sat down with Alex Jones and I even hosted the Infowars show for a segment. Uh, and then we went into a long interview. Um, so I'm having that come out, but I'm uh, afraid to put that on YouTube. So it's probably gonna be on my Rumble. It'll be on my Odyssey. It'll be on my podcast. It won't be on my YouTube just because I'm afraid of the backlash that it'll have. But I was surprised at just the backlash I already got. People saw me on Infowars, even from my own daughter who's like, he's such a bad man, and he said these bad things. And uh, I told my daughter, I'm like, look, okay, so he said bad things. It made people feel bad. Like, that's wrong, and I don't approve of that, and he shouldn't have said that. Okay, whatever. But, like, it's not illegal. <laughs> it's not illegal. It shouldn't be. Um, you know, in his, in his defense to what he said, he's like, you know, he goes live, whatever, four hours a day, so that's, whatever, 20 hours a week, uh, you know, whatever, almost 100 hours a month he's live. He said the total amount of time he talked about that topic was 24 minutes, I think is what he said. And he said the same thing as you. He never mentioned anybody's name. He never directly said anything or whatever. Um, and some of the comments I got from other people were like, well, he used this to his advantage. He's trying to gain from this. I'm like, he talked about it 24 minutes. The media has talked about it hundreds of hours. Who's using what to gain? Uh, but digging back into some of the things that you said, because it's way worse than I had even imagined. <laughs> um, it's way worse than I even imagined. So they're denying him all these things to the point that you're making. Um, and I didn't write them all down. But um, how are they able to do that? I mean, <laughs> is it because they have a, a judge that's just going along with it and they're doing it? I mean, uh, will he be able to appeal this? I mean, I, I understand laws are being changed and it's becoming more and more unfair, but for the ones that are still there, I mean, doesn't, isn't there some sort of recourse there? There should. The problem is it's the failure of the judicial branch and the judicial branch is not stepping up uh, to meet and protect Alex Jones's rights because he's Alex Jones. So the other dynamic is that there's sort of an underlying class conflict in all of this because most of Jones's supporters are working people. So they, they may be business people, they may be successful people, but the, they are not the professional class, the clerical class, the managerial class. They don't have a bunch of little letters after their name, like we're reinstating old English royalty these days with JD or MD or PhD and all that jazz. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the group that doesn't like Jones is from that professional managerial class. So Jones has an underrepresented as part of his audience. And for people that don't know, I mean, this is a man who, according to government's own polls, media's own polls, uh, over 30 million Americans are are huge fans. Right. That's as many people who vote in the Republican presidential primaries to give people an idea. So that's the scale of his influence. His influence is he has been the biggest critic of the deep state of anybody in, in recent American history. He's one of the most important populist voices out there. And that's why he's being targeted. Uh, that's why. And there's this mythology. Like most people who bash Alex Jones remind me of the people who bash Rush Limbaugh. And I'd be, I'd be, they would describe a caricature. They would describe someone that's not the person. I'm like, okay, you're bashing someone you've actually never watched. You've actually never listened to. You've actually never read. If you're going to bash them, at least, you know, engage with them and then come up with a determination. Um, but the, it's this caricature of them. But there's this underlying class conflict where the professional class hates them. The statists hate them. Uh, the, the working class, the working person, the ordinary felt person, they love them. 
But in the judicial branch, which is making all the decisions here, it's, it's by definition dominated by the professional managerial class. So in their little group, in their little bubble, Alex Jones is almost universally despised. So they can just ignore the rules. The other scary thing is, I mean, th this is a tri these trials make idiocracy's trial look like a beacon of justice. Oh, That's man. how bad they are. Um, and they're parodies of parodies. And the problem is no, none of the other judges, because that's the only people who can put a stop to this, higher courts. So it's all judges getting to decide the ethical conduct of judges, which I've always had a problem with. Uh, they're, they're all in on it. I mean, they, they all want Jones hurt. So, they're, for example, Jones was because he made criticisms of a lawyer from his own TV network early on in the case. The judges said, if you become if you are sued, you lose your free speech rights as to that case. Would never happen. That's directly contrary to U.S. Supreme Court law. But unless the U.S. Supreme Court gets involved, and they almost never do, the other judges get away with violating his rights. And if anybody thinks they're not planning on using this as a precedent, that's the mistake. Yeah. They're using Jones because they know he has inadequate political protection amongst their colleagues in the professional managerial class, in the press, and in the legal world. Uh, but then they're going to take that precedent and apply it to everyone else. It's what Big Tech did. People may not remember when they took down Alex Jones, they lied about it. Right. They said, oh, this is limited to Alex Jones. We're not doing this because of his speech. We're limited. It's certain incidents that occurred. They could never find or identify what those incidents were. Right. Very similar. They had like a fake trial of their own kind. And then, of course, they said, well, later on, well, we took out Alex Jones for wrong thing. We can take out the president of the United States for wrong thing. Right. So the uh, they're going to do the same thing here. And that the pro there should be remedies at the Court of Appeals. In reality, other than the Texas Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court in those respective cases, those are the only courts that might uh, actually do justice. The problem is they don't have to take the case. The judges that do have to take the case uh, are willing to violate the rules to get at Alex Jones. And in doing so, they want to establish new rules so they can get at the rest of us. Yeah. So it's almost like uh, these judges have it out for him to the kind of pace, uh, case that you're making. Um, and if he got another judge that was more sympathetic or really want to uphold the law, regardless of who it's being examined against, uh, maybe he could catch a, a break. But that's not happening. But I think what's even more uh, dangerous is to the point you're making is that even though they're ignoring the law, um, once they rule this way, then it sets precedent. So they're almost they're ignoring the law. But then if they rule this way, they're actually changing the law. That's exactly right. Okay. And that was what they're going to they wanted to show that they could do a modern day show trial and get away with it. And they could do it as to someone as well known as Alex Jones. and well despised. <laughs> and, exactly. And that was the and because Today he's well despised. Tomorrow they'll go to the person who's not as well, right. who may, who's just well despised by the wrong people. Mm -hmm. they, they'll continue to escalate uh, in the same way Big Tech did, right. and they'll say, "Hey, we did this in the Alex Jones case, so we can do it to you." So they try to find something that has general consensus in the community that most people would agree that if this guy said mean things about parents losing their kids everybody would agree that's probably not good and so then they take that everybody agrees that well let's let's prohibit that from happening and so uh, everyone nope nobody wants to stand up for it and they're just okay seeing it happen to this bad guy um, not realizing that they're next <laughs> I guess right? that's exactly right they're, they're, they're signing their own death warrant yeah. so so there's there's one one, one when you're talking about it and we'll, I want to jump into this later but just as you're talking about it um, this big takedown that just happened was this Andrew Tate and I was watching part of this interview with uh, uh, Patrick Beck David on Valuetainment, and um, he was just saying how, um, look, I don't have viewers, I have fans. And the difference is my fans will follow me to wherever I go. They don't just watch me because I'm there. So Alex Jones, he got wiped off the face of the earth. He's still alive and well on his main channel. He still has millions of people tuning in regularly. Those were fans, right? And so uh, Andrew Tate said, those are my fans. He said, and they don't want me standing up and saying these things, having fans. And he systematically broke down how all these things they're trying to accuse him of were all taken out of context uh, from little snippets or whatever. But anyway, I don't want to jump into that. The, the next thing, so that's, okay, so, so Alex Jones, they're taking something that has just general consensus, and they're using that to chip away at freedom of speech. Then we have this uh, tornado cash, and I don't know how much you looked into that, but tornado cash is a protocol that allows people to mix their cryptocurrencies to uh, gain more privacy. 
Now, they say that, uh, well, criminals use this, terrorists use this, and they could be laundering their money, and then they're going to go blow up schools and kill little kids. And, of course, nobody wants that. Uh, I, don't, I have little kids. I don't want my, school, uh, my kids' school bombed. And so that has general consensus. We all agree that's bad. But then they try to attack this uh, a protocol, a public utility that's been, as I understand, three times the Supreme Court has upheld that uh, encryption as freedom of speech. So it seems to me it's an attack on freedom of speech. Oh, no doubt. And, and it's freedom of speech at multiple levels. So <clears throat> they've often tried to use the monetary or regulatory angle to, circum uh, to limit speech. So that's what Citizens United was all about. So like you look at campaign finance reform, often campaign finance reform was about making a person get the consent approval of an elite donor class, right? If, of, if one person can uh, be the sole donor of a campaign, then you can run for office if you don't have your own money and, you, and it's, let's say you don't have the means of crowdfunding back in the day, then uh, with just the support of 1% of the economic elite. Right. But if you if everybody's limited at what they can contribute, they can require you to get the consent of 20 to 25 percent of the economic elite because it, it becomes its own form of donor control of campaigns. And the one part of this was always how can any of this happen when money when it, you cannot have speech if you don't spend money on that speech? Right. I got a mic here. Mm -hmm. If suddenly having a mic means I don't get the right to speech because it costs me money to have the mic then all of a sudden I lose my right to free speech. Without the freedom so it, of payments, there is no freedom, right? Precisely. Yeah. And so uh, currency is power, and the and currency is the means by which speech is expressed and the means by which speech is heard, which is always important for people to remember, that what they're trying to do is prohibit our ability to hear what we choose to hear. And that's part of free speech. It's not just the right to speak. It's the right to hear what we want to hear. Freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of belief, freedom of religion, freedom of press. That's what they all come back to. The right for me to hear what I want to hear, not the government to gatekeep it for me. Uh, and so they were always going to go after anybody in the crypto space that they thought they could. I mean, that's a lot of what the SEC actions are. They're trying to convert everything into a secured transaction as if it's a publicly traded stock. When that's a real reach, in my view, they've they've always to uh, expanded the definition of security to reach things that were not originally intended in the legislation. I mean, you see it so many different places, sure. the FDA trying to regulate medicine, the USDA trying to regulate little Amish family farmers. Uh, and so the same context here is they want to be able to get in and restrict your ability to express yourself and uh, have meaningful power to have your voice heard and to hear what you want to hear by using the disguise that this is about monetary control of a, a financial instrument. Yeah. So, um, and it's also because of encryption. So I think it's the encryption that's been upheld as free speech. It's like it's code. They printed it out. They took it to the Supreme Court and they said, yeah, that is code. Um, and then also the precedent that this sets too, because it's a public utility. So typically people are sanctioned or nations are sanctioned. Maybe there's some due process there where that person could defend themselves, maybe. Um, but we don't have a public utility. So because a criminal drove on a road, now we're going to sanction the road. <laughs> uh, because right. because a, cr a criminal drove in a car, we're going to sanction a car. Because a criminal used a protocol, then we're going to sanction a protocol. Uh, what kind of precedent does that set? All of it kind of reflects a broader principle of what they allow to have, uh, who they allow to give privacy and secrecy to, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's always it's like I always get a kick out of the government that says any means of privacy or any means of secrecy will be the key for criminals to do bad acts. Yet somehow, when it comes to the government, privacy and secrecy are absolute must. Yeah, we uh, they must have things classified, etc. But I mean, isn't the same government that told us secrecy equals criminality, privacy equals criminality? So the now we and it, it's a good transition. It, it goes into the Trump case. So it like here you have Trump where the government is asserting that the deep state is asserting that administrative bureaucrats, you call it the national security apparatus, call it whatever the you administrative want. Administrative state. <laughs> right. Exactly. The administrative state. These are people that have they have no elected constitutional power of their own. Their only power comes from the president of the United States. And yet they are putting the, the uh, former president and likely future president of the United States under criminal investigation because he chose to keep his own documents. 
on the grounds that they, the administrative bureaucracy, the deep state, gets to gets to decide what is and isn't classified, that they decide what is and isn't a presidential record, that they decide what is and isn't a national security record, that they get to uh, decide over the president. In other words, it's someone who only has power from the president getting to declare they have power over the president. It is an attempt to not only criminalize political disagreement and use criminal lawfare to go after their most uh, critical political adversaries, but it's an attempt to usurp our entire constitutional system of governance so that they get to decide what the people get to hear and see, because it's the same version of it. That's what classification is all about. Who gets to hear it? Who gets to see it? Who gets to know it? That's a decision that's supposed to be made exclusively by the president, by the Constitution, and by prior decisions, yet they're actually in court arguing that it's a crime for the president to have it. It's a crime for the president to try to declassify it, that they, the deep state, get to unilaterally decide what the people get to see and hear, even though nobody gave them that power, not the people, not the Constitution. I just, I mean, hearing that, I just don't see how they have any leg to stand on. Uh, to the point that you're making, uh, there's, they specifically don't have the power to do that. They're, they're trying to take it, but they don't have it. And so, what's, what, what leg do they have to stand on? And, and I guess then in this, is this something that's again sort of like this show trial? Um, they're taking something that maybe has this uh, big unanimous kind of consent, and we'll get more into this. Uh, uh, framing of these MAGA people. We'll get more into that in a minute. But um, does this have any weight at all? Or is it similar to like these impeachments that they didn't have a chance? Everyone knew they didn't have a chance. It got shut down, but they still did it anyway. Is it like that? Or is there actually teeth here? There's no legal merits at all to their claim. In fact, it's a very perilous precedent they're trying to set. However, it is like the Alex Jones case. Is It's another example of our judicial branch and our justice system breaking down. There's enough rogue prosecutors, enough rogue FBI agents uh, who in a D.C. jury pool, because the case is being handled in the District of Columbia, which there's problems up to begin with. But basically, the swamp gets to judge the swamp and gets to judge the critics of the swamp. And we've already seen in jury trial after jury trial, they're just politically biased. So they can have uh, somebody completely guilty and they let him walk because they like his politics. They can have someone completely innocent and they railroad him because they dislike his politics. So I say that Martin Luther King had a better chance at a fair trial in 1950s Birmingham than any MAGA or Trump supporter has in the District of Columbia. And so because the the D.C. Jurors are the grand jury and the trial jury, and you have a lot of weak need, politically corrupt judges in the process. That's how this case could somehow end up in an indictment, which would be utterly insane. It would be without legal precedent, without legal merit. It would be the open, overt political weaponization of the criminal justice system for a corrupt and competent president to blame to actually take out his political opposition. I mean, here you have Biden's administration trying to indict the, uh, the, the candidate who is leading in the elections against him. This is something you hear about from third world nations, yeah. but it is right now contemporary reality in America. Well, and um, when Trump was running b- against Biden last time and this whole Ukraine call came up and then they, uh, he said, fine, here, listen to the call, whatever. But they said that he was they were trying to go after his um, opponent, uh, Biden. And that was the big deal. How, how dare you go after your opponent? Right. But now that's exactly what's happening here. Exactly. And they're doing it openly and overtly. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, like they complained when Trump was critical of Hillary and said she belonged in jail. They complained when he was going to expose the Biden corruption in Ukraine. The uh, in, in, and we've seen what that has led to in terms of the war in Ukraine and all the other problems that we now have under the Biden administration. But, yeah, I mean, it goes even worse than that. Going to suppressing speech. Uh, they are going after Project Veritas for simply getting access to Hunter by Bi- uh, to Ashley Biden's diary concerning a very questionable conduct, to put it kindly, of the president of the United States and his own daughter, according to his daughter's own words. They're trying to put people in prison for simply sharing that information with members of the press 
and they're trying to put James O'Keefe and Project Veritas in prison, shut down Project Veritas, put James O'Keefe in prison again after they you know, wrongfully went after him about a decade ago or so. And it shows you how nuts it is. And the FBI is acting as the private personal Stasi of the incumbent administration and the, and the deep state apparatus. And they're weaponizing the legal process in a way we've never witnessed before. And unfortunately, so far, the judiciary has been an inadequate check on that abuse of power. Yeah. Well, and when the and, and now we're also seeing them frame up the, the judiciary branch as being uh, bad, corrupt, uh, outdated, et cetera. So now we see these uh, ramped up attacks on the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court's an activist court now. And the Supreme Court needs to be we need to impeach Clarence Thomas and like all these other things. So not only are they using this uh, legal system um for their own weaponization, but they're also attacking it and uh, breaking down the integrity or at least, I guess, the opinions of, of people towards that court. They're trying anybody that pushes back within the court system gets attacked. So the judge that issued a special master requirement in the Trump case, which is very common protocol, by the way, nothing she did was unusual at all. What was unusual is raiding the president of the United States. That's never been done before ever in American history. What's unusual is claiming that the deep state has legal control over classification designation of records over the president who controls them and from whom all authority flows. That's what's unusual and unprecedented. What's unusual and unprecedented is, is one administration going after their political opponent in such an overt way. Uh, the All of that's unusual. What the district court judge did was simply say, let's have a third party involved, a special master, to make sure this is done correctly. And what happens? She gets personal death threats. There's people already being arrested for it. Where does that come from? Political media press criticism. Because they believe that all tools of power should, our ends justify the means, that they will weaponize any tool and anybody who doesn't go along gets attacked. Even if you're the most well-established justice of the most well-established legal institution in the world in Clarence Thomas. Their, their point of Clarence Thomas is if we can go after him, we can go after anybody. So you better play ball and do what we, we demand you do and ignore the law and weaponize it for our political purposes or your own personal and professional careers at stake. Man. A breakdown of our institutions at the at the highest level and at the fastest pace that I could imagine ever seeing this. I was really shocked when we saw the leak at the Supreme Court on the Roe v. Wade situation. And so we have the highest uh, institution, the highest court in the land, and an activist, obviously an activist, leaked this because it was a very sensitive information on one side, right? Um, a very polarizing thing that was leaked. And that was a complete breakdown of trust in the highest institution. But then um, the Supreme Court had also rolled back some uh, policies, I believe, on like on, on guns, concealed carries, et cetera. The state of California hated that, was very open about that. Uh, the governor of California and the head of the DOJ, the, uh, the DA said that they were, or AG said that they were going to do everything possible to overturn that. And then like a week later, all the records just mysteriously got leaked in California. Like we're witnessing uh, the breakdown of the highest level of institutions in the land. Completely. And it, it's part of a generational shift that the new generation of power, the new left, I tell people, if you want a comparison, don't look to the 1960s for the mindset of the new left, that uh, it looked to the 1930s. It's very much a statist uh, goal, and it's very much that the ends justify the means. So and that they've been taught this in various ways from the time they've grown up. Uh, throughout their educational institutions. The the slow march through the institutions, as Gramsci called it, the, the sort of Marxist objective to take over society from within, has effectively taken place in America's educational and cultural institutions. It's why our films are such crap. You know, that's why our TV shows are such crap. Uh, I mean, completely, just one after the other. I mean, they, they destroy Star Wars. They destroy Star Trek. They destroy Marvel. I mean, they, they just, they're going through one after the next after the next. Now they're going after Little Mermaid. It's going to be one thing or the next. It's because they want to culturally control the minds of the populace and the people of this new generation that says the ends justify the means, that free speech is actually bad because free speech is dangerous speech. Free speech is harmful speech. Free speech is hurtful speech. So these are people who grew up, in, you know, uh, uh, my niece went to Tufts where they had 94 different safe spaces. And I was like, nobody at Tufts even disagrees with one another. Yeah. What do you need 94 safe spaces yeah. from? And it's just one after the other. And it's that kind of mindset 
that is now in places of power within the press, within the academy, and within this and within the government at multiple levels of the bureaucracy. And they're trying to weaponize everything around them. And that's why they want to use these test case examples, whether it's Alex Jones or Trump, to see how much can they just purely politically weaponize the process, ignore all of our customs, all of our traditions, all of our rules, all of our respect for law, all of our constitutional constraints. Can they just eviscerate them so that they can achieve and attain their objective and use the any tool of power they have around them, whether it's a human resources or advertising department at a company, or it's a administrative bureaucracy or local state court be, uh, bench to get their political objectives. And that and we are living without doubt in very interesting times. Yeah, to say the least. So you said this is similar to the 1930s. So sometimes I have to try to just like, let me let me let me think about this logically. Let me let me look at this at a, at a historical lens. Um, there's many times throughout history where things have been much worse than they are today, um, um, from from every different angle we want to look at. Um, and so you said this is similar to the 1930s. Another thing I look at is again back to kind of my original statement of a war of information. And so they need to control the narrative. The internet has caused them to lose that narrative because now we can all converse without their mainstream media. Now we see the rise of the um, uh, alternative news sources that are, you know, beating them in every angle. The Joe Rogan's getting 200 million views, um, et cetera. And so if they're not able to control that, like an Alex Jones, they did delete him off the face of the earth, but yet he's still alive. So then, well, what comes next? So I guess sue him into oblivion. Uh, that's kind of the point that you made earlier. But also, if you look back in U.S. history, twice in the last hundred years, they've made it illegal to say anything critical of the state, right? Was it 1941, the Smith Act, and 1918, the Sedition Act? And so they could just say it's a crime to say anything critical, and they've done it before. Do you, do you see that being a reality or a danger? Or is there anything that I'm missing in that historical lens? Well, that's where the January 6th cases are very dangerous, as well as some of the Trump cases, because what they're trying to do is reinvoke the specter of the Sedition Act. So the Sedition Act, for people that don't know it, you know, was passed during World War I, and it was utilized, and it was a different variation. We first tried it, the alien and sedition laws, back in the right at the beginning of the founding of the country. Rightfully, our core founding generation got it stopped and reversed so that it never came back again. And, and it took you know about 200 years before it actually came back again in one way, shape, or form. But it took at least 100 years before it, 120 years or so, before it came back at all. And what happened was during World War I, people forget a presidential candidate was actually put in prison, Eugene V. Debs, for saying, uh, for solely for speech. He said he was opposed to World War I, and he opposed the draft. They called that sedition. They locked him up. They put him in federal prison. So they're looking to that. And it, when I started hearing talk in the January 6th cases of rather than treating it as a, je a basic trespass riot case, which is what almost all of the alleged criminal conduct could be labeled as. And there's a lot of peculiarities about how everything came about in that context, why the security was strangely missing, why some security people were in engaged in provocative behavior at attacking the crowd. Uh, you know, the a lot of people that went in there didn't realize it was illegal because they showed up later and the doors were open and they're walking around. Yeah. So there's all those issues. There's whether or not the government was complete. turns out like over 70 or 80 undercover feds were part of the crowd yep. from various information that's already come out. So there's a lot of reason to be suspect about what really happened that day. But putting that aside, even in the worst case interpretation of it, the behavior is behavior that is just your old school trespass, rioting, disturbing the peace kind of crimes. This happens on a regular basis throughout America. Usually it's almost always the left doing it, you know, taking over a government building that was prominent throughout the 1960s, all those things. That's, you know, it's disturbing the police, uh, the peace, it's a trespass, et cetera. And then all of a sudden they start talking about sedition and obstruction and conspiracy. And I was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. That, what that is attempting to do is to use the January 6 cases because it's another example where it's the District of Columbia. So you got a corrupt jury pool at the grand jury level, corrupt jury pool at the trial level. A lot of judges who are part of the swamp don't want to judge and govern and discipline the swamp. The prosecutors are all connected to the swamp. Uh, so you have a very corrupted system of justice and they want to take what they're doing in the District of Columbia and export it everywhere across America. 
And that's scary problem number one. Scary problem number two is they're using the sedition laws to start to expand the prosecution. And sedition laws are basically just speech laws. They really are. They that you engaged in a certain public protest or public speech or other conduct. And consequently, we're going to call it a crime you can serve the rest of your life in federal prison for because we don't like the purpose of said speech. I've always considered the sedition laws laws that are unconstitutional and never should have been allowed to exist in the first place. We have we already have criminal laws for treason. We have criminal laws for everything on under the earth right. uh, that could possibly be a crime. We don't need to create new criminal laws that can be used to target and punish protesters. But that's exactly what this is. And and that and so the pre, that old sedition precedent is now coming back for the first time in about a century, a hundred years, by the in the January six cases. And that'll be something to watch because they want to use those cases to establish a new precedent that they can accuse anyone that is a has a, unapproved opinions that they consider threatening to the government's well being as sedition. Which is super scary, um, but um, I guess also I, I'm always trying to find a sliver of hope here. Um, we saw these draconian measures and these uh, crazy laws. You, you, to your point, I, I wasn't aware, but a, a presidential candidate went to prison over speech. Um, but then it got repealed and things got better. So uh, we've seen things like this go in before and get overturned. Uh, we're going back down the same road again. Um, it's scary, but maybe it gets overturned again at some point. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's up to the people. I think the one restraint in all of these cases, whether it's the Alex Jones cases, the Donald Trump case, the January 6th cases, uh, the, the, the cryptocurrency area related cases, is it, it's all going to be it's all only going to change if the courts have either the confidence or the courage to step forward. And that's only going to happen or the legislature has the ability and willingness to step forward. That's only going to happen if the court of public opinion is sufficiently outraged. So when this was tried by corrupt actors in the early 1800s under the Alien and Sedition Acts, it was public outrage that led to the repeal of those laws. When it was done to Eugene V. Debs and then we had the Palmer raids in 1919, the, the, the J. Edgar Hoover used all of these political oriented cases to rise to power and create the independent FBI that now is one of the most corrupt institutions in American law enforcement uh, and, the, and the whole justice system. What, uh, there was enough public outrage in the 1920s and 1930s that it all got repealed and pushed back and the deep state drew back. The 1970s, the same thing. I mean, after we had one Kennedy assassinated, another Kennedy assassinated, a King assassinated, uh, Malcolm X assassinated, a president taken out in Nixon, then that's when there was enough public outrage about what's going on in our government that it led to the MK Ultra investigations, the assassination investigations, exposing the deep state, exposing the CIA, exposing the NSA, exposing the FBI with COINTELPRO due to the thing in media. So it's, it always comes back to the same thing. It's the power and the will of the people because it's the fifth pillar of power under all the other pillars of power. If public perception falls, then the whole system falls. So it's very Matrix-ish in that respect. And so it, the, the, the best way to defeat the system, the best way to stop these abuses is to take the red pill and give it to everybody else. And if enough people get it, enough people share it, enough people speak out about it, that's when things will change. Yeah, I was, uh, as, as uh, you were talking about this, I was thinking about this. Um, I was trying to find the number here, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, this was uh, January 10th, 1963. The House of Representatives and later the Senate began reviewing a document entitled Communist Goals for Taking Over America. It contained an agenda of 45 separate issues um, that, in hindsight, were quite shocking and then equally stunning today. So, um, I forget who the president was. Maybe it was, J was it J. Ever Hoover that was like taking on communism and then there was the McCarthy era, whatever. So anyway, um, in, on January 10th, 1963, the House of Representatives received this document and they had these 45 declared goals of communism. Uh, many of these uh, we've seen all over the place, uh, but one of which I forget, it's down like number 30 or 40, was uh, to discredit and uh, destroy the FBI, like get, lose all credibility of the FBI. Um, and, and that's uh, kind of where we're at right now. That's what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, the FBI has managed to do it to itself. Right. So you had the Federal Bureau of Investigation created by J. Edgar Hoover, and it was always had a political bias, but it was political bias wasn't a partisan bias. And that's what's changed now. The FBI, like I just saw a Harvard poll yesterday, more than half of Republicans don't like, don't trust, don't respect the FBI. That's unimaginable just five years ago. 
the the biggest defenders of the FBI have been your historical conservative Republican in America. But what they've witnessed over the last, and this is where they've made mistakes. They've overreached. Like if they had, had limited themselves to just uh, the January 6 cases, they might have got away with it without much public scrutiny or blowback. But when you go after Donald Trump, a man who just won 75 million votes, a man who's the leading candidate to get the presidency in 2024, a man who has a, has a the strongest base of any American politician in the country in quite some time since probably Ronald Reagan and the depth and intensity of support of his audience, of his of his fans. Going back to that, he, he doesn't have viewers. Donald Trump has fans. Right. Um, that that has backfired on them politically. And, and it's where if they were smart, they would care about their public perception and step back from this. But you have some the most dangerous thing we face currently is that the court of public opinion might not always be a check on these folks because they show a lack of self-restraint. Uh, they show a lack of regard for the fact that they are being publicly lambasted for their bad acts. And that makes them more dangerous probably than they ever have been before. Yeah, it's, it's actually worse than that. And this kind of leads me to the next topic I want to jump into, which is um, in the, the, the court of public opinion, to your point, maybe doesn't matter to them anymore because exactly what we're hearing in the United States, but also I saw it come out of Europe yesterday, but uh, we'll talk about that. But basically what we're seeing in the United States is that uh, per Biden's speech, uh, he gave two speeches. He gave one, uh, the one with the red background and the Marines in the background. The one before that, a few days before, he said, oh, you Second Amendment supporters, what chance do you think you have against us? We have F-16s. So he's threatening Americans? That's pretty bold. But what I see angling from that is um, he's basically saying, all you guys, you're extremists with your views. Um, you have no chance. And he's demoralizing people. They, you better just stand down. You stand no chance. Then went into the next speech, sp singling out MAGA Republicans. And they're the threat. They're the biggest danger, demonizing them angling to the point where I think it's setting up for this indictment, because what they're trying to do is demoralize people, discredit people, and make MAGA people the worst, so nobody's going to want to stand up for MAGA. Well, I, I'm, I'm against what you're doing, but I, I don't want to stand up for MAGA because you've said MAGA is bad. But even worse than that, they're saying that it's a threat to our democracy. And so uh, they asked, uh, I saw a question was asked of the uh, White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, I think her name is, and, and they said, uh, so what uh, what what defines this uh, extremist? She said, well, an extremist is anyone that doesn't go along with the mainstream ideas. And so what they're saying is um, it's a threat to our democracy if you don't like what we say. So back to the point that you made, the court, the, the court of public opinion, anyone in the public opinion doesn't agree with them. They say, well, you're a threat to democracy. You're not going along with mainstream, even though Biden has a 38 percent approval rating. So we could argue who who is mainstream. But um, that's a very dangerous precedent where they could ignore public perception because they don't agree with what we want. So it must be a threat to the democracy. It, it's very much sort of safe space ideology now being expressed in institutions of power. So it, it's the, this is a whole generation of people who've grown up believing that if you disagree, then that makes you evil, that makes you bad, that makes you dangerous, that makes you hurtful, that makes you harmful, etc. It's what unites all of these threats, that whether it's January 6th or Alex Jones or Donald Trump or crypto or all the rest. It's there's something hurtful, something harmful about your speech. And thus, you are an extremist if you're advocating such hurtful and harmful speech. Also, their idea of democracy is a crock. <laughs> they don't believe in democracy. Yeah. When they say democracy, they mean them having all the power. Right. And now the rest of the world has been saying this for over 100 years. They say when America comes talking about democracy, they mean American power controlling our society and our economy and our resources and our politicians. They don't mean actual democracy. Patrice Lumumba gets elected. We help coordinate his killing a year later in 1961 in uh, in in Africa. Well, the great democratic hope at the time. Uh, you know, we believed in democracy so much we facilitated and enabled and entrapped Nelson Mandela for arrest. So the rest of the world knows that America's when it says democracy doesn't mean democracy. But now the American people are discovering that, too, that the American leaders don't mean democracy. They mean their governance, that you are challenging our ability to control your life. Right. And that makes you a dangerous extremist with hurtful and harmful speech who must be excluded from politics.
polite society. They've been weaponizing the vaccine mandates, as an example, to go after and get rid of any closet Trump supporter or really closet free speech supporters, closet liberty supporter out of the government. I mean, I've been getting uh, I've been hearing from people in every aspect of government, even some aspects that people might find surprising the institutions they work for, where they're being purged under the guise of a vaccine mandate. And so it's the same thing. There's a, no dissident speech allowed. Any dissident speech must be banned, must be prohibited. People must be fired for it, but people must be removed from power from it. They must be labeled and socially stigmatized. It's very much 1930s. It's very much a communist a Stasi Germany kind of style of approach. And, it, and, and they're using the FBI and top law enforcement like the Soviet Union used the KGB and the East German Communist Republic used the Stasi. It's, it's it's almost all parallels, one after the other, after the other, after the other. The press control, the communication control, the speech control, the weaponization of civil justice, show trials, the weaponization of criminal justice powers, the sto- social stigmatization to anybody who's a dissident, independent of thought. It's almost identical to the list you went through. We're seeing it in live time. That social stigmatization. So if you look at the Bolshevik Revolution, you look at Mao's Great Leap Forward or Hitler, whatever you want, but like a Mao's Great Leap Forward, um, they had the, the Red Army and the Red Army was the people. It was the people turning on the other people. The government and the military can't control the people. So they need to get the people to turn on each other. And Mao had reflected and said, wow, I can't believe how vicious and violent these, red, these, uh, these people are. He did nothing to stop it, of course. But if they can, get, um, if they can, if they can uh, stigmatize to the word you used, um, MAGA Republicans, I mean, who would want to make America great? I mean, how dare you make one? I mean, to, to, even, to even stigmatize that word. But um, if they could make, if they can get the, public people to turn against each other and stigmatize them, then people don't want to stand up, one. And two, I mean, it, I, I think we're already starting to see the violence. I mean, it could get really bad. Oh, no doubt. It, it's collective punishment. And I say, I encourage people to look at how the Ukrainian government is governing, because that's also an example of what they would like to see. And there, what do you see in Ukraine? You see collective punishment of dissidents. You see complete suppression of speech. You see locking up of the press. You see complete banning of opposition. They took their opponent, opposing leader, locked him up in prison, and then bragged about it on national TV. They shut down any independent press that exists, while awash with all forms of corruption, deep state collusion, and uh, ex- uh, excessive war. So Ukraine is what the West will convert their own countries and societies into if they could. And it should be a warning sign to the rest of us that we are ultimately the, the, the key barrier to them being able to pull off what they want to pull off. And as long as enough people resist and push back their agenda and do so through lawful and peaceful and democratic and constitutional means, they, we can sustain our constitutional uh, experiment of liberty and freedom a little bit longer. Yeah, of course, which is exactly why they're trying to take it, uh, take it over. Um, so first, uh, rip out the tongues so, you, so you, they can't say anything. Don't allow any kind of uh, public discourse to remove any kind of uh, legal uh, protection or precedence or constitutional protection. Um, and then, you know, once no one can talk anymore and once there's no more protection, I guess then they can have their way. I was thinking about, um, so I recently uh, published a book. It's on Amazon last month. It's titled The Uncommunist Manifesto. So basically took the Communist Manifesto and just kind of rewrote it. And it's called The Uncommunist Manifesto. Um, and so thinking a lot about communism and how communism seems like it's this old word, but really it's just all just been rebranded, right? So in the, the original Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx said to summarize communism in one statement would be the abolition of private property. Today we have Klaus Schwab at the WEF saying, you'll own nothing and be happy, <laughs> Uh, right, we had uh, communism or socialism was uh, the state controlling the means of production. Today, from the WEF, we see this uh, public-private partnership. And I think about this public-private partnership where uh, we now have uh, Zuckerberg told uh, Rogan that you know the FBI came and talked to him, and um, Twitter had to put back on Alex Bernson because they found out through discovery that the government somehow administrative had had pressured them to get him off etc so you kind of have this public private partnership where the private side is the social media etc let's let's wipe them off the face of the earth uh and then if that doesn't work for the people that get through that filter the alex jones that still won't go away well that's where the public side comes in and now we'll use the weapon of the doj the fbi or uh, whatever against them yeah, completely. I mean, it's the way they, 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 they see power differently than our founding generation and the ordinary American. 
We look at power and we see what purpose does it serve, what principle can it advance, and what restraints must it operate within, and what methodology of approach of making decisions will be the best one over time. They see power, they see any of these things, and they simply see a tool, a tool to be used for their objective and agenda. And it, it doesn't matter what it is. This is why you have these people doing things at college admissions, screwing people over at college admissions for political reasons, excluding students uh, for, for these reasons, people getting uh, not getting promotions, getting demotions, getting fired uh, in, in the employment context, advertising choices being made and marketing choices being made and YouTube algorithm choices being made and movie and, and TV choices being made and book publishing choices being made at every level of power. They see how can I use this as a tool to advance my agenda, regardless of what that power is for. So if the power is supposed to have independent literary cultural value, they don't care. They see it as, oh, this is a means to get people to do what I want. Right. Uh, if employment is supposed to be about the job and whether you're qualified to do it, they don't care. They see this is an opportunity for me to advance my political agenda. And once you understand that, you can predict where they're going to go. And it is a very frightening place. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned the 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 V for Vendetta president speech that uh, Biden yeah. gave, where they literally took the background and the set from V for Vendetta, where the guy's up there. You know, he even he even did the screaming bit. You know, he even did that bit. Yeah. You know, the I mean, the, the almost exactly like it. And it's it's because they see they watch movies like 1984 and V for Vendetta, and they think, golly gee, wouldn't it be great if we could be that government? Yeah. You know, I mean, the totally perverse mindset. But that's why we have to resist because that's who these people are. Yeah. Do you think um, so? Now we have uh, all the censorship we talked about. You know, Andrew Tate getting deleted. Obviously, Alex Jones being the kind of poster child for that. Um, but now we've, we, you know, we see it, 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 it's volatile, right? So then Alex Bernson, he got wiped off the face of Twitter because of talking about COVID. Uh, but now they had to let him back on. So now he's back, and now it seems like there's a lot of open talk about that stuff supposedly now, which is pretty interesting. But we're also seeing the rise of these, you know, uh, the growth of these alternative platforms, the parlors, the rumbles, um, et cetera. Um, I mean, do you think they'll they'll probably continue to attack those, right? Again, going back to kind of controlling the free speech, sedition act, et cetera. I mean, they they want to shut it all off. So even those other platforms, as 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 they may be popping up, uh, probably won't be allowed to stick around for much longer. I, I think there they're going to have some hurdles because the key was how to fight back intelligently. And so Elon Musk simply talking about and trying to buy Twitter, and now they're in lawsuits because it turned out Twitter has a lot more bots than they were admitting. So he thinks he over he overbought it now what he may get out of that is a much deeper discount and haircut and still end up owing it but as soon as he talked about buying it all of a sudden twitter became a lot less censorious for a period of time still a lot of censorship that takes place but not to the same scale as you know now you look at rumble rumble is a meaningful competitor because of who is investing in rumble it's now public news that the wall street journal put out there peter Thiel, jd vance a bunch of people like that people with political influence people with uh, uh, strong economic ties people with deep resources uh, right now in fact rumble has sued google in that case is going into the discovery stage so because rumble planned a certain approach a disciplined methodological approach to being able to uh, meaningfully compete and provide an independent platform, it's going to be very hard for Google and YouTube and the rest to take them out. It's going to be very hard for them to remove them from the, the store. They're already fa uh, like the various apps. That's their current monopolistic source of control is the control of apps on phones and, and on uh, laptops, Apple and Google. That's one of the key places that needs to be uh, attacked and legally to, to stop that monopolistic power from continuing to be able to use for speech control purposes. But I think the approach Rumble is taking, I mean, Russell Brand has announced he's going to be doing exclusive things. A whole bunch of other people are saying they're going to be doing exclusive exclusive things on Rumble. Rumble continues to upgrade and improve its techno uh, its technological capacity and capability run by Chris Pavlovsky, who's deeply personally committed to creating a free speech space that's independent and separate from cancel culture. I think Rumble may be a meaningful competitor, and I don't think they'll be able to take him out. And that's one of the best white pills in recent time period during this era. Yeah. So I see I see light. And what I see is you said we, we need to get this court of public opinion to turn. Uh, obviously, they understand that. So that's their attack vector. So that's part of this uh, Viva Vendetta speech is trying to attack uh, the public perception. But at the same time, um, you know, just back to Andrew Tate, the one thing I was thinking is um, – he was he was growing so fast. He was adding over a hundred thousand people per day 
on Instagram, a hundred thousand people a day. And, um, he has a message that's very similar to, um, to Jordan Peterson's, which is suck it up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So what if you got dealt a bad hand? It's the hand you have play it the best you can, you know, uh, slap yourself. It's up to you kind of a thing like that. And, um, that's obviously a totally different message than what we get from mainstream media, which is it's okay. You're a victim. You can never get ahead. And, um, what I see both from the rise of Jordan Peterson and with Andrew Tate is like, there's a need for that. Like people want that. And so there's this massive market, which of course is why they want to shut down, but that's encouraging. Uh, you mentioned Elon Musk trying to buy Twitter, uh, when he put that bid in and it was all about opening it up for free speech. So it was really, to me, it was like this free speech, the price, the, the Twitter stock jumped big time with 30, 40% gain at a time when the rest of the markets were dropping. That again shows there's this massive thirst for freedom of speech. The price drove up um, the rise of rumble. So there's all these things. So I, I do see uh, light. I do see hope. Um, but at the same time, man, they're coming after us hard. It's coming after us hard. I made the comment to my wife um, a couple weeks ago and I said, uh, I think there's above average chance within the next two years I might not be able to be in the United States doing what I'm doing, meaning being critical of the government. Um, what's your under over on that? Where do you think we're going in the next couple of years? Well, the way I put it is there's no uh, great hero story without a great villain. And we definitely have a great villain. And the only question is how many of us are going to be capable of being great heroes? Uh, because I think that capacity is there. We are going to face a lot worse. They are doing things they've never done before. They're trying to establish precedents they've never utilized before. That means they're coming for the rest of us. Alex Jones is again the canary in the coal mine. They're going after the president of the United States. That answers all your questions about what's the chances they go after me. If you they see you as a threat, the answer is high. But the upside to this is it presents an opportunity for people to prove the courage of their character. You know, Pancho Villa, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Provides a lot of, op you know, Medgar Evers said, you know, most men die a thousand deaths every day. I'm only going to die once. It, you know, great adversary, great evil presents an opportunity for great courage, great honor and great truth. And we're all going to get the opportunity and the American people and the people around the world are going to get the chance to show that. And I still have. I'm my, uh, I love to bet. I'm a gambler by nature. I like sports betting. I like political betting. You name it. Uh, I will always bet on the conscience and the soul and the heart and the mind of the ordinary everyday person to resist this and to maintain the fight for freedom and liberty moving forward. Mm. So good. So good. I, I, I don't want to add anything onto that. I think that's a good place for us to break because um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a message of hope. It's a message to rally behind. And I think um, yeah, unfortunately we have heroes rise up. Unfortunately, we also have martyrs in the movement. Um, and, uh, but I think when we stand up for ideologies, it's stronger than anything that the other side can throw at you. So you, 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 you said it perfectly with that. We'll go ahead and sign it off. Uh, Robert, um, you know, I'm going to link to your Twitter. I know you're super active on there. Anything else you want to call attention to? Everyone should be following. Oh, sure. Pete. Yeah. If, if people want to find all the content, any, uh, and also be part of a community, that shares similar interest as we've been discussing today. They can get that at vivabarnslaw.locals.com. And what is that? Uh, it's a locals community. So locals is is part of is owned by Rumble. It's an independent platform to replace Patreon, replace Subscribestar, and really replace Facebook. So people get to make their own post. I post exclu I post a Barnes brief there every day that's curated news and information content from across the globe. Uh, we do exclusive videos. They have a hush, a series called Hush Hush, which is about the alternative interpretation of events, various conspiracy theories that have been debated over time, everything from the Kennedy assassination to the moon landing. We discuss and debate book reviews, movie reviews, but also people get to interact with one another. They get to post themselves. They get to comment. And it creates a community free of algorithmic manipulation, mm -hmm. free of subject matter censorship, free of trolls and harassers and stalkers, uh, where people really get to share ideas about how do they make the world a better place in these very unique times we face mm, that's awesome everyone should check it out we're going to make sure it's linked down below and with that we'll sign it off thanks so much robert thanks everybody all right that's a wrap hopefully you enjoyed this conversation with robert barnes it was insightful 
It was scary, but it's important to understand what's going on. I always say an ostrich can bury its head in the sand, but it won't keep it from being eaten. So we need to know these issues so we can empower ourselves, empower all those around us. So share this interview with as many people as you can, because there is hope on the other side. But only if we wake up and rise up, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Tell me if you're going to share this video with some other people. And of course, give me some thumbs up on the video if you liked it and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. And then check out some other videos.